particularly to the idea that a nearly viable embryo may think. We are surprised, shocked into laughter and repelled. Nothing human is alien. But a baby is not human. An embryo is far less human. That, perhaps, was why Emma learned more from the toys than did Scott. He could communicate his thoughts, of course. Emma could not, except in cryptic fragments. The matter of the scrawls, for example. Give a young child pencil and paper, and he will draw something which looks different to him than to an adult. The absurd scribbles have little resemblance to a fire engine, but it is a fire engine to a baby. Perhaps it is even three-dimensional. Babies think differently and see differently. Paradine brooded over that, reading his paper one evening and watching Emma and Scott communicate. Scott was questioning his sister. Sometimes he did it in English. More often he had resource to gibberish and to sign language. Emma tried to reply, but the handicap was too great. Finally, Scott got pencil and paper. Emma liked that. Tongue-in-cheek, she laboriously wrote a message. Scott took the paper, examined it, and scowled. It isn't right, Emma, he said. Emma nodded vigorously. She seized the pencil again and made more scrawls. Scott puzzled for a while, finally smiled rather hesitantly, got up. He vanished into the hall. Emma returned to the abacus. Paradine rose and glanced down at the paper with some mad thought that Emma might abruptly have mastered calligraphy. But she hadn't. The paper was covered with meaningless scrawls of a type familiar to any parent. Paradine pursed his lips. It might be a graph showing the mental variations of a manic-depressive cockroach, but probably wasn't. Still, no doubt it had meaning to Emma. Perhaps the scribble represented Mr. Bear. Scott returned, looking pleased. He met Emma's gaze and nodded. Paradine felt a twinge of curiosity. Secrets? Mm, no, no, Emma um, asked me to do something for her. Oh. Paradine recalled instances of babies who had babbled in unknown tongues and baffled linguists, made a note to pocket the paper when the kids had finished with it. The next day, he showed the scrawl to Elkins at the university. Elkins had a sound working knowledge of many unlikely languages, but he chuckled over Emma's venture into literature. Here's a, a free translation, Dennis. Quote, I don't know what this means, but I get the hell out of my father with it. Unquote. <laughs> The two men laughed and went off to their classes, but later Paradine was to remember the incident, especially after he met Holloway. Before that, however, months were to pass, and the situation to develop even further toward its climax. Perhaps Paradine and Jane had evinced too much interest in the toys. Emma and Scott took to keeping them hidden, playing with them only in private. They never did it overtly, but with a certain unobtrusive caution. Nevertheless, Jane especially was somewhat troubled. She spoke to Paradine about it one evening. Those toys Harry gave the kids? Yeah. I was downtown today and tried to find out where they came from. No soap. Maybe Harry bought them in New York. Jane was unconvinced. They showed me their stock. Johnson's a big store, you know. But there's nothing like Emma's abacus. Hmm. Paradine wasn't much interested. They had tickets for a show that night. It was getting late. So the subject was dropped for the nods. Later, it cropped up again when a neighbor telephoned Jane. Scotty's never been like that, Denny. Mrs. Burns said he frightened the devil out of her, Francis. Francis? Little fat bully of a punk, isn't he? Like his father. I broke Burns' nose for him once when we were sophomores. Stop boasting and listen, Jane said, mixing a highball. Scott showed Francis something that scared him. Hadn't you better? I suppose so. Paradine listened. Noises in the next room told him the whereabouts of his son. Scotty? Bang! Scotty said, and appeared smiling. I kill them all. Space pirates. You want me, Dad? Yes, if you don't mind leaving the space pirates unburied for a few minutes. What did you do to Francis Burns? Scott's blue eyes reflected incredible candor. Hmm? Try hard. You can remember, I'm sure. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't do nothing. Anything, Jane corrected absently. Anything. Honest. I just let him look into my television set, and it scared him television set? Scott produced the crystal cube. It isn't really that, see? Paradine examined the gadget, startled by the magnification. All he could see, though, was a maze of meaningless colored designs. Uncle Harry... Paradine reached for the telephone. Scott gulped. Is, um, Uncle Harry back in town? Yeah. Well, I got, I got, I got to take a bath. Scott headed for the door. Paradine met Jane's gaze and nodded significantly. 
Harry was home, but disclaimed all knowledge of the peculiar toys. Rather grimly, Paradine requested Scott to bring down from his room all the playthings. Finally, they lay in a row on the table. Cube, abacus, helmet-like cap, several other mysterious contraptions. Scott was cross-examined. He'd lied valiantly for a time, but broke down at last and bawled, hiccuping his confessions. Get the box these things came in, Paradine ordered. Then head for bed. <laughs> Are you going to punish me, Daddy? We're playing hooky and lying, yes. You know the rules. No more shows for two weeks. No sodas for the same period. Scott gulped. <laughs> you going to keep my things? I don't know yet. Well, <laughs> good night, Daddy. Good night, Mom. After the small figure had gone upstairs, Paradine dragged a chair to the table and carefully scrutinized the box. He poked thoughtfully at the fused gadgetry. Jane watched. What is it, Denny? Don't know. Who'd leave a box of toys down by the creek? Might have fallen out of a car. Not at that point. The road doesn't hit the creek north of the railroad trestle. Empty lots, nothing else. Paradine lit a cigarette. Drink, honey? I'll fix it. Jane went to work, her eyes troubled. She brought Paradine a glass and stood behind him, ruffling his hair with her fingers. Is anything wrong? Of course not. Only, where did the toys come from? Johnson's didn't know. They, they get their stock from New York. At Abacus, don't they give people tests with such things? Paradine snapped his fingers. Right. Say, there's a guy going to speak at the university next week, a fellow named Holloway, who's a child psychologist. He's a big shot with quite a reputation. He might know something about it. Holloway? I, I, I don't... Rex Holloway, he's, uh... He doesn't live far from here. Do you suppose he, he might have had these things made for himself? Jane was examining the abacus. She grimaced and drew back. If he did, I don't like him. But see if you can find out, Denny. Paradine nodded. I shall. He drank his highball, frowning. He was vaguely worried, but he wasn't scared. Yet. Rex Holloway was a fat, shiny man with a bald head and thick spectacles, above which his thick black brows lay like bushy caterpillars. Paradigm brought him home to dinner one night a week later. Holloway did not appear to watch the children, but nothing they did or said was lost on him. His gray eyes, shrewd and bright, missed little. The toys fascinated him. In the living room, the three adults gathered round the table where the playthings had been placed. Holloway studied them carefully as he listened to what Jane and Paradine had to say. At last, he broke a silence. I'm glad I came here tonight, but not completely. This is very disturbing, you know. Huh? Paradine stared, and Jane's face showed her consternation. Holloway's next words did not calm them. We are dealing with madness. He smiled at the shocked looks they gave him. All children are mad from an adult viewpoint. Ever read Hughes, High Wind in Jamaica? I've got it. Paradine secured the little book from its shelf. Holloway extended a hand, took the book, and flipped the pages till he found the place he wanted. He read aloud. Babies, of course, are not human. They are animals and have a very ancient and ramified culture as cats have and fishes and eaten snakes. The same in kind as these but much more complicated and vivid since babies are, after all, one of the most developed species of the lower vertebrates. In short, babies have minds which work in terms and categories of their own, which cannot be translated into the terms and categories of the human mind. Jane tried to take that calmly, but couldn't. Yeah, you don't mean that, Emma. Could you think like your daughter? Holloway asked. Listen. One can no more think like a baby than one can think like a bee. Paradigm mixed drinks. Over his shoulder, he said, You're theorizing quite a bit, aren't you? As I get it, you're implying that babies have a culture of their own, even a higher standard of intelligence. Not necessarily. There's no yardstick, you see. All I say is that babies think in other ways than we do. Not necessarily better. That's a question of relative values, but with a different sort of extension. He sought for words, grimacing. Fantasy, Paradine said rather rudely, but annoyed because of Emma. Babies don't have different senses from ours. Who said they did? Holloway demanded. They use their minds in a different way, that's all, but it's quite enough. I'm trying to understand, Jane said slowly. All I can think of is my mix master. He can whip up batter and potatoes, but he can squeeze oranges, too. Something like that. The brain's... A colloid, a very complicated machine. We don't know much about its potentialities. We don't even know how much it can grasp. But it is known 
that the mind becomes conditioned as the human animal matures. It follows certain familiar theorems, and all thought thereafter is pretty well based on patterns taken for granted. Look at this. Holloway touched the abacus. Have you experimented with it? A little, Paradine said, but not much, eh? Well, why not? It's pointless, Paradine complained. Even a puzzle has to have some logic, but those crazy angles. Your mind has been conditioned to Euclid, Holloway said. So this thing bores us and seems pointless, but a child knows nothing of Euclid. A different sort of geometry from ours wouldn't impress him as being illogical. He believes what he sees. Are you trying to tell me that this gadget's got a fourth dimensional extension? Paradine demanded. Not visually, anyway. Holloway denied. All I say is that our minds, conditioned to Euclid,